creativity goes beyond a pencil and a paintbrush. Hello, creative people, and welcome to I Am Creative. My name is Hollis Citron, and we are so happy that you have chosen to spend your time with us. So what are we doing here? We are really diving into this word creativity and what it means. In all of the conversations that I have had, nobody has ever defined creativity as drawing or painting. People have defined creativity as your soul's essence, that magic spark, how you show up in the world. What my true mission is, is to really expand this definition and allow people to be able to see themselves in it. Because when people see themselves in this definition, when they've never been told that they fit inside of it, they stand up straighter. They feel like they have something to offer the world and basically are happier humans. So these conversations are structured on three questions. One, how do you define creativity? Two, how do you incorporate it into your life? And three, why do you think that it's important? So let's just dive right in. So my inspiring guest for today is Vashti Klein. She is a multimedia artist. She's inspired to create films, poetry, and music that will have a positive ripple effect in the world. She is a native of Louisiana, and Vashti combines different genres, styles, and media to create what she hopes are works that are a source of solace to her audiences. She's a prolific filmmaker, singer, songwriter, and a poet. Vashti paints an indelible picture of healing with her multi-dimensional films, poetry, and music. Vashti, welcome to the space. Thank you. Great to be here. I'm so Thank happy you that you're me. here. <laughs> I'm sorry, just interrupted you. Say it again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you're welcome. I'm glad you're here. So before we dive in, I would love to hear from you if you would share a fun fact about yourself. Sure. Um, I um, I was a line producer for two uh, uh, kung fu films, feature films. Uh, and in one of them, I drove the getaway car. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So you were the line producer and you drove the getaway car. Yes, I did. Oh, my gosh. So did, you, did you get to go really fast? Oh, I laid about two feet of rubber. <laughs> yeah, it was funny because I, the producer wanted me to use my car. And uh, I was a little nervous about it, but uh, the and the actress, who was Cynthia Rothrock, couldn't drive a stick. So he said, "Well, we'll get somebody else." And I said, mm, "You know," and so I said, "Well, I'll drive." Okay. So I laid about two feet of rubber, and they told me later that the um, the lighting director was sitting next to the executive producer when I took off, and um, the executive producer said, um, "That's fascist car, right?" And he said, "Yeah." He said, oh, she's going to be mad. And the lighting director said, that is Vash. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. So, oh, my God. So, okay. Do you, do you generally drive fast? No. Anyway. <laughs> no. <laughs> so this was freeing. This was what? Was it freeing? Like, this is like... This oh, was like you mean a whole liberating? different side. Like, yes. Liberating. Oh, well, I do have that side. <laughs> but I, I keep it in check. <laughs> I guess the more I've gotten older. I hear my dog thumping in the background, by the way. So he's flinging something around. So <laughs> See, everybody. So we talked about this before we, before we um, started, is that you hear the real authenticity of what's going on. So... <laughs> Welcome to the dog. So what's your dog's name? Arlie. Arlie. So Arlie is joining us for this podcast. He certainly is. <laughs> so Arlie, welcome. <laughs> okay, well, that is a really fun, fun fact. And we're going to learn more about how you've gone from where you were to what you're doing now, how everything kind of got enmeshed and incorporated. So mm -hmm. the first official, official question is, how do you define creativity? Um, well, for me, it's like uh, it's an unbidden thought or a feeling that just comes from somewhere in the universe. 
you know, you're never quite sure where it comes from, uh, but it compels you to create something. Um, you know, creativity is like a feeling of excitement, um, of unlimited possibilities. You know, you're in that open-minded mindset um, where there's just, there are no constraints. Mm. That's a big part. No constraints. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So take us on a little trip wherever you want to start of what you've done, because you have such a varied background. <laughs> it's true. Such a varied background. I know that music was a big thing in your family. Your dad was in the military, which you can tell us if that meant that you traveled a lot. Um, with all that you've done, three degrees in college, like take us on a little time capsule and take us to where we are now. Well, I guess uh, I would start, you know, when I was a child, I loved to sing. Uh, and uh, my, my, my parents used to play a lot of operettas and, things in the house. So I was always singing along with things even back then. And as I got older, um, in my teens, um, <clears throat> I learned to play the guitar. And so I started singing with, uh, with my boyfriend, we would go around to different places, you know, the um, uh, nonprofit, you know, events and things like that. And we would sing and stuff like that. And uh and so I guess um, as time moved on, I, at one point we sang at a, at, a, at a place called the Cellar Door, which is not there anymore. It's in D.C. Okay. And it was kind of a big deal. And they had a competition and we won the competition that night and they played us on the radio. And I was very excited. But I began to realize that, that the life of a musician is from about 10 o'clock at night to about three o'clock in the morning. Mm. <clears throat> And I just thought, I just don't think I want that life. Right. And uh, <clears throat> and not to mention, you know, it's it's not an easy life to to make money or anything. So I uh, ended up going to college to to um, study. Actually, I started out studying psychology, but I ended up studying film and uh, got a degree in film and. Uh, Got my first job in a small production company in Silver Spring, but I also worked in press. You know, one of the things when I was putting myself through school, I worked on Capitol Hill uh, and the, and the for the Senate Finance Committee. So um, it was it was more to the communications end of of my education. But after working on a political campaign, I then finally got a job in production for a small in a small production company. And there I really learned about directing in, in the real world, you know, and mm -hmm. editing. And I learned how to edit in 12 languages. And uh, I had a wonderful uh, boss who taught me about directing and gave me opportunities that I would likely not have had any place else. And after that, I um, formed my own company which I had for about 10 years, production company. And uh, wow. at that point, um, my husband at one point, he had to have a uh, triple bypass. And then and I was an entrepreneur and he was an entrepreneur. And I said, you know, I was thinking if anything happened, because he was at that time, we had just gone from, from normal health insurance kind of premiums to out of the park, you know, from literally my, I used to pay, like he was on my health insurance and the production company and I had Blue Cross. It cost $20 a month to have him on that policy. Oh my gosh. And within, uh, I think it was like 1990 <clears throat> when all hell broke loose, uh, it went from that to $600 a month, mm, right. you know? And so that was when all this happened. So I said, you know, I, I already had a few years in the government. And I said, you know, right now for me, they all say, go, you know, go for your bliss. And I thought right now for me, my bliss is security for my family. And uh, so I went back to work for the government and worked in communications um, for, uh, for a number of years. And then 
when I left the government, went back and started my own company again and started singing again. And, um, and that, I don't know how much, <laughs> I don't know how far down the road you want me to go there, but uh, I started singing again and I had a, uh, I had a health scare. Uh, I was supposed to have a surgery the, um, that I was told I would either, I could potentially be hoarse the rest of my life or lose my voice completely mm -hmm. and be mute, mute and, uh, or lose my life in the surgery. It was a major surgery. And so uh, my life passed before me over that three or four weeks before surgery. And um, I literally, I mean, I reviewed my whole life because you don't know if you're coming out of it. Right. And, um, and the process itself was just, it was, it was grueling and terrifying. It was terrifying. But it, the odd thing was that the night before surgery, mm -hmm. I had this dream that my surgeon was like floating in the air, kind of a medium shot, you know, and he was just smiling. And he said, everything's going to be perfectly fine. And so when I woke up the next morning, I was not afraid anymore. You know, I went in there and, uh, uh, and I, and people were so kind, these health professionals, they don't know you from anyone and they are falling all over themselves to be kind and compassionate and considerate. I mean, even the anesthesiologist, I <laughs> was struck by all the questions he asked. I know they were professional but like he said, um, uh, do you, um, oh, he said, do you have dry eyes? And I said, I do. And he said, do you like the thick eye, you know, the viscous eye drops or the other? And I said, oh, the viscous, please. And I thought nobody's ever asked me this <laughs> questions about my preferences in my life. Uh, so, but, but anyway, so went through the surgery, everything ended up fine. I'm perfectly healthy. And, uh, but I took about six weeks to um, to get my voice back because you know I had the, the uh, breathing too. Okay. And, um, and I, I mean, I was just so happy to wake up and know that I was okay. Mm. And um, so for this next six weeks, I gradually, gradually worked up to singing again until finally I could feel my my voice came back. It was actually better. the The timber was better. Um, I was able to hit high notes that I, so easily, mm -hmm. and um, it was just um, it was a healing. Uh, it was such a healing feeling because I felt like my heart just opened, and mm -hmm. so I started going around singing locally, and people would come up to me and say, you know that was wonderful. Or, you know, you really touched my heart or one lady came up to me right after I had finished singing a song, threw her arms around me and sobbed for about five minutes. I was like, what's wrong? And she said, Oh, that was so beautiful. And I, and, and so, you know, so then I began to think, well, maybe this is something I can offer, you know, because it's touching people and it's helping them. And, and I'm seeing that, that there's a healing power in music. And so I, from that point forward, I mean, I produced two albums over the next three years, I guess, and, and, um, and published them. And then, of course, as, as I was writing more and more, I'm realizing not everything's a song, you know. And so I started writing a lot of poetry. And that started resonating with people. And... Um, and so that brought me to where I am today, where um, I'm continuing. I haven't gone out and sung for a while, just for a variety of reasons. Well, COVID, um, but um, but I've been writing a lot of poetry and um, creating uh, video poems, and they are really resonating um, with people. So um, so that's kind of my journey right now. I mean, I'm I'm focused on on sharing those things that I think will touch people. And uh, even for a minute, I mean, sometimes when you read something that touches you, it can change your life. 
Yeah. Uh, and and even because sometimes people they'll read something or they listen to a song and they feel heard. You know, because it's resonating with them. So I feel like if I can do that, um, that that will be a life well lived. You know, because it'll always be out there. Always. Yeah. And there is the power of, I mean, the power of music, the power of that vibration. It has, it does truly have healing qualities. And obviously with where you've shown up and what you've done, it, it's been proven. I mean, you've had people come up to you and hug you and give you immediate feedback. That doesn't happen all the time. No, no, not at all. Um, and I wasn't even expecting it. I was at that point singing just from my heart. Yeah. Because I was glad to be alive, frankly, you know, and, and glad to be able to sing again because, you know, I, I wasn't singing. I've never sung for the purpose of performing. Uh, it, it's a healing um, experience for me. Right. Um, I just like, as you're saying, the vibration, there's something about when you're singing, the vibration in your body. And there's, there's this, you kind of lose a sense of yourself. You, you're, you're, you're somewhere. I don't know where, but um, uh, so it's a healing feeling for me. But, and when I began to see that it was affecting other people, um, then I thought, well, you know, that that's what I'll do. Even if I don't go out and perform, if I can just record, uh, uh, record music and, and publish it, um, you know, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not going to be look, you know, singing in every gin joint from here to <laughs> Mississippi that is not on my dance card right now. Um yeah. I don't think it ever I don't think I ever wanted to do that. And part of me thinks, why would you do that? I mean you can do so much more if you record. Yeah. Yeah. So many more people. But as you're speaking, what kind of is what I'm hearing is you were so grateful for everything that you went through, everything was, this was a pure, this was a journey. And then you get this message in a dream that everything's going to be okay. And you meet so mm -hmm. many incredibly heart centered people along the way. And then as you are healing, you're truly heart centered. So it, it's kind of like this, when you're in your head and you're constantly analyzing and thinking things, I find get stagnated. Because mm -hmm. you're overanalyzing, you're th you're you're not coming from authenticity. You're right. kind of you're, you're, but here you're just open. So mm -hmm. and you're coming from this purely heart centered space, which people it's a vibrational thing. People know that. People feel that. And this is where you get this reaction from people of, oh my gosh, you have no other. There's nothing else getting in the way. Exactly. I mean, just to have somebody, I remember, I mean, they're just little things, but, uh, but I mean, they were big to me, but remember uh, uh, finishing a song and going to sit down and there was a man sitting at a table. And as I walked past him, all he did, he just went. And that said, it, I touched his heart. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was just, that meant everything. Um, it, it's just a very, it's, it's wonderful to know that you reach somebody at the heart level. Yeah. Yeah. So for everybody, since this is an audio, what, okay. what, what she did was she touched her heart. It's like this pounding where people, the person just gave a signal, a hand signal, which is so beautiful too, because I love that with unspoken word, that there's this exchange that can happen. Obviously you're using your voice to to do that but then when someone can give you an exchange back and they can do that with a hug they can do that with a smile and then they can do that just by tapping their heart and it's understood it's this communication that's just universal yes yes and 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 on that note so to speak uh the universality of music yeah um, is just uh, uh it's uh, there's nothing to compare with it um because it's it 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 it's it goes across culture, yeah. You know, it goes across uh, ethnicities. It goes across. I mean, when you see these concerts where 
you know, you'll see, you'll see somebody singing at, um, you know, there are 10,000 people there and they're all swaying, you know, to the music. They're all swaying. Um, that's, that's what's, that's what will save us because it's the only thing that is common, the common language that we all have and that we share the, the one thing we can share in mass, you know, if the only thing we can share in mass is lore, then that's going to be the end of us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's why, that's why the arts are so important because it, they're all from the heart level and, 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 and the expressiveness is, it's, it, it's an open kind of expressiveness, you know, which you don't find in any other, any other field. Yes. It's un, unencumbered. When you're talking, when you're talking about a concert, I mean, there's so many different formats, uh, mediums that I can bring attention to that you've been in that are these um, these mass um, uh, connectors, film, mm -hmm. um, music. With music, that is the beauty of anything. And with film, you can sit there, but I'm immediately thinking of this joint connection of being in this public space where everybody is there for the reason to listen to the music and people are happy. Right. Like, there is a happiness that people know the songs or they don't know the songs, but they're familiar. They are, they're swaying, they're singing along, they're talking to strangers next to them because you have this common bond of liking this person. And it amazes me that when people travel around the world, when musicians and like immediately, like, I don't know, I love pink and she's just coming to mind, but anybody, she sings in English and she's going to these foreign countries country still singing in English and still people are you know because in other countries you know they learn various languages which is incredible but it's like this common it doesn't matter the language it's kind of like it's the beat it's the everything that goes along with it that everybody is there and they're just happy yes absolutely and the common is a common experience it's a common they're, they're all having a common reaction at the same time the same thing, as you say, is true in film. Yeah. You know, when you go to it, that's why I hope they never get rid of going to the theaters because it's just such a special experience to be in a, a room with so many people watching one of the people that you don't know. And you're all laughing at the same time, pretty much, <laughs> you know, or, you know, or, or scared. To, I mean, I can remember seeing um, Alien, <laughs> oh my gosh yes, yes. Alien. when it first came out so honey weaver right and you know the big scene when the thing comes out of the stomach and everybody in the room screamed you know it was hilarious um so true it, but these transcend um i guess maybe they transcend bigotry and they transcend you know hate um that's why they're, the arts are just so important. Yes. And unfortunately, a lot of them, you know, they they keep taking things more and more out of the schools. And, you know, all the things that are important, they're, they're thinking, oh, well, that's not important. <clears throat> this is probably the most important. The most important. I had two things to say to that. But the first is... Terms of endearment is not a comedy. <laughs> every time, every time I see it posted on something, it's under comedy. I'm like, what are you talking about? Because I remember being in the movie theater and all you could hear was <laughs> like, there was so much crying going on and you were trying to suck it in, yeah. but <laughs> not a comedy. Not a comedy. They obviously, whoever was doing that had not seen the movie. Because it's not a comedy. <coughs> it is not in any way a comedy. <laughs> no, no. But there was another point that I was going to make to that, and now it completely skipped out of my brain. So I'm <laughs> sure it'll hit me later. But um, but anyway, I will I will I will move on from that. Um, but let's touch on before we get to the second question. I would love for people to hear a little bit from your perspective too about the editing process a little bit and the directing 
I, I wanted to ask you too about, you can edit in 12 languages. Yes, I, I was. And, and you may wonder, how is that possible? Yes. <laughs> um, oddly enough, I mean, I don't know how they're doing it today. But at that time, you had a script in English and you had the foreign language script and they divided it by scene. So it was all the same length, you know, you know, the timing, like, like the first scene is a minute and a half or whatever. And so the first scene of English is, and so the, the first um, scene of Russian is, um, but it, it, and so they, it, and so you, and you had the script in the other language too. So you could kind of see where it ended and it was supposed to have been recorded in the same time frame. But in some cases, they had to record things a little bit slower because there were more, you know, depending on the language. Right. Um, and uh, so it could be tricky. Um, I think the trickiest was Dutch because they have no syllables. <laughs> they just, everything is like they start a word and then they're at the end. <laughs> You're not sure how they got there. You know, like, <laughs> so, you know, there are just little odd wrinkles like that, but, um, but it really did refine my editing skills too, you know, in terms of timing and stuff. Um, <laughs> and you're, re you're really listening. I mean, you have to really, and I don't know if people fully understand this, but um, to be an editor, there's so much um, attention to detail so much and everybody an editor is who makes the film <laughs> so yeah. yes there is that there is this, everybody has their part and contributes everything you wouldn't have it if you wouldn't make it to the editor if you didn't have all those parts to it mm -hmm. but the editor really puts it together to make a fluid story mm -hmm. that's if, right. it, if it doesn't flow there's a reason it's kind of like there's something weird but you may not know what it is but it's the way that it was put together yes well, and they, you know, they, they correct all the director's mistakes. They, you know, they, they can, when somebody shoots something in a certain way and they didn't shoot quite enough of it, the editor, editor knows how to change to a different angle or do a voiceover or do something that's going to, you know, smooth it out because, you know, Sally fell down in that shot, you know, I mean, <laughs> so you've got to get a different shot or a different angle. Um, you know, the editor's there. The, the editor saves the film. I absolutely agree with you. Um, and as I think we were talking earlier, too, and, and it's a technical it's a technical hat to have on as an editor, because at, at any moment, you know, you're you're constantly making decisions about you got to shave a couple of frames off here. Um, I got to make sure that, you know, they're going from right to left in this scene because just the other scene they were going from, you know, left, to right. Um the sound you have to you know slide the sound in you, there's just all kinds of things going on and depending on the kind of project you're working on if your client is sitting behind you they are in this creative mindset while you're in there like hmm no i think i gotta go another three three, three frames and they're saying oh this is just so great you know shouldn't we shouldn't we do this and shouldn't we add special effects and shouldn't we and i, I remember you know, it was really hard sometimes not to just turn around and say, could you like put a sock in it? <laughs> I cannot do this and what you're doing. And so finally I decided um, I should have a t-shirt made that the front of it said, tell me all your great ideas. And then the back of it would say, shh. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> it's sort of the gentle way to tell them, you know. <laughs> but it also the wonderful thing about editing is that's the point at which you know all of the shooting's been done you've got all of the source material right there and and that's where you get to create when you're directing you know it's and it's a kind of an introverted you know internal kind of process that you're going through when you're directing it's the opposite you know everything is out you know, it's all externalized. It's it's talking to your, you know, five or six department heads at five o'clock in the morning and saying, you know, they are saying, they're all looking at you and saying, where do you want us? 
you know, you can't say, I don't know, just pick a spot, you know. Right, 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 right. They're looking for direction. <laughs> They're looking for direction. Camera, first camera set up here, second one there. Um, but then by the time uh, you get to editing, you're so grateful to go into a room and have your coffee and have nobody around you, just all of the source material. And then you can play with it. And <clears throat> those magic moments are so special when the whole thing comes together, when a scene comes together, when the music hits in just the right spot, you know, and it just brings tears to your eyes. And, you're, and you, you sit back and you're like, that's good. That was really good. Yeah. You know, it's so satisfying. Both, both things are, but in different ways. <clears throat> I mean, that is the magic of storytelling. It's here you have, you have it. And here to me, it's like the perfect, it's so good for you. It's such a good match because you have this whole visual, you have the action, you have all this. And then the music is intertwined and the music help guides you on how you're feeling. Um, yes. And then it's these culminating moments and it, it's just, it's an art form. It's like an orchestra. It is. And the, the music is another character. Yeah. You know, it just pulls it all together. Um, I remember taking a class on Hitchcock and uh, that was so interesting to me because uh, there was, I forget, it, I forget the film, but there's a scene where somebody's walking down the street and a dog is barking. And the instructor said, you know, they added the dog. And you're like, oh, he said, what you're dealing with is sound is another element that you yeah. can take out or you yeah. can put in for, a, for effect. And so it's not that, you know, you're looking at something from the perspective of this is reality. Somebody's walking down the street, you hear a dog barking. But in this case, the dog is barking because he doesn't know the person. Mm. that's why dogs bark right, right. <laughs> and only Hitchcock would you know have have thought to do that you know to give you that oh, oh something's about to happen and you don't know why when you're watching it you don't know why but something in your gut says something's going to happen here it's because the dog was barking <laughs> oh great it's those subtleties <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, if you're not aware of this, you will watch things in different ways. Our daughter, since my husband, my husband is a TV film editor and growing up with this, my daughter curses him because now she cannot watch a movie or a TV show without the editing process in her head. Like she'll notice that maybe the shirt is different or that the cup was moved and the edit wasn't a smooth edit because the cup isn't in the same place as it was in the next. Like she's just like... <laughs> Damn you. <laughs> I, I am aware of these things. <laughs> she almost has to watch it twice because the first time when you watch it, that's all you see. You know, yes. I mean, you can be overwhelmed by so many things the first time you see a film. But when you're looking at it from a technical standpoint, you know, and you're even, even, I remember we're going in to see, I've, I've been editing something for a long time, this documentary, you know, not a lot of money, you know, that. And then I went to see, um, what, what was the, the famous pirate movie? This Spielberg, uh, Captain... Uh, like the Pirates um, Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah, well, it, it was a different one. It was earlier than that. But it was on a ship, a set probably, but a, a ship that must have cost $10 million. And I, <laughs> that's all I could see. Because I was like, I just came in for <laughs> adding this little little editing booth, you know, uh, and with, you know, barely enough money for our coffee and tea and <laughs> person. And I said, Oh my God, the money in this. Um, so uh, yeah, you, then you have to go back and watch it a second time to actually see the movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you're wearing those set of eyes and when you have that awareness, um, those are the things that you notice. So, so, so God, such a great conversation. Okay. So, Let's find out a little bit more about you in the sense of how you today incorporate more creativity into your own life for you. Um, 
I find that uh, in order to be creative, you have to you have to willfully make room for it by creating quiet time for yourself by you know stress free zones you know going for a walk in nature going for a walk with your dog um i find like listening to other artists and reading about them i find that inspiring <clears throat> i i remember not long ago i was reading about um this wonderful musician her name is rihanna giddens have you heard of her mm -mm. Um, she's she's won grammys and she's won everything under the sun but she she's very talented in a variety of genres but she decided all of a sudden she wanted to write an opera i mean here she's coming from folk from blues you know and she said i want to write an opera and she did and she had it produced and just reading that to me was so inspiring because i had written a couple of songs that were different from the songs i normally write and they were more theatrical and, uh, and I kept thinking, well, do I really want to, you know, put the energy into this? But I kind of like the songs. And after reading that, I thought, you know what? Go for it. Finish it. Yes. I, I released uh, one of them this year called Shall I? Um, and it, all you can do is, you know, you can't edit yourself. Ah, love you that. Too much. Uh, because, you know, you're biased. <laughs> You know, you, you have a certain bias. If, if you don't have like Madonna's confidence, you know, um, there's a tendency to say, well, I don't know, maybe people won't like this. You know what? Put it out there. If they don't, do something else. You know, take in the feedback. But if you edit yourself, you'll never do anything. That's that whole worthiness thing, right? I mean, it's am I good enough? Am I... And like you said, you know, what are other people going to think? Lately, this topic of, and I know it's been a big thing lately um, in general, but in my personal conversations, perfectionism has come up a lot. Mm -hmm. And in noticing that it's happening, this trickle down effect with children, even at younger ages, having, mm -hmm. so, having so much experience in working with kids and adults, but I would notice generally around fourth grade, fifth grade. So that's kind of like uh, eight to 10 years old. You can start to notice more of an awareness and more of a, you know, caring what other people think. Mm -hmm. It's actually trickling down to like first grade kindergarten. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Of, of, of perfectionism. It's not always, but I've been seeing it as young as that, the societal thing of, um, that's crazy because, you know, one of the things I've noticed lately is that most of the artists, or let's just say many, I, I don't know if it's most, but it seems like the ones that have been the hugest hits have been the quirkiest. Mm -hmm. Have they not? The ones that you would think, well, you know, if, 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 if somebody got up there and did that, you know, and they hadn't, they hadn't made it big yet, you might say to them, you know, you might want to tone that down a little right. bit. right. <laughs> It's true. Mr. Jagger. <laughs> it's true. Mr. Prince. Mr. Get some, Prince. Get some better pants on. <laughs> Not those skivvies. Yeah. Exactly. And guess what? People love it. They love the imperfection. I mean, when you see somebody singing something and they lose it, I mean, you know, I don't mean lose it in the sense of, you know, going crazy, but they just really get into it and they just let everything go. People love it. They love it. And I, I know some musician friends of mine now have been saying they're just starting to record things and they're just they're just going with it. They're like as if they were singing live. They said, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going back and you know, drilling down to every single line and the word, and I didn't quite hit that note. They're like, I'm done. I'm gonna I'm gonna record 20 songs instead of five you know, and get them out in the world. And people like it. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing too, is when you're editing yourself as a musician, a vocal coach told me this once, she said, when you sing something, you are familiar with all the different times that you've sung it. And you know, there've been times when you sang it really well, other times not as well, but only you know that. Only you know that. So when you're singing, 
to an audience for the first time. This is all they've heard. And they think it's great. In your mind, it's like, oh, it's not as great as it was that time when I did it. But they didn't hear that time. Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes I'm, you know, it's just as good or better. Because, you know, that's the only thing they're hearing. <clears throat> Thank you for saying that. And I think this can apply to anybody. So everybody listening, like this applies to business. This applies to, you know, you getting up and doing a speaking gig. This applies to your business ideas. This applies to inventions. Like put it out there. It's like throwing spaghetti on a wall and seeing what sticks. It's like the exploration of it. If you don't explore it, if you don't get it out of your system and like play around with it, 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 it just, it doesn't have a chance to even exist at all. Like things need to be, it's the shaping, it's the sculpting, it's the tweaking, it's the, all of these things that need to happen. And what you just said, which I think is so important of, we attach stories to events. So these whole idea of, I can't do that because I failed that time. Because do you remember that time I got up and tripped and I literally almost fell on my face when I was doing a speaking engagement and I felt stupid and then I forgot what I was going to say and I got all flustered. So then you have an idea in your head. I can't do that. Right. Instead of being like, okay, that happened that time. Not everybody <laughs> saw that. Certain yeah. people saw that in that space. But if I work on that if it's a concerted effort or whatever it is it doesn't always have to be that way that yeah. was that one little blip in time that was that one yeah and it, it was a different audience probably yes you know so this audience didn't see you fall down you know so it's you're fresh you can <laughs> you know you can just do it this time um and plus even the audience that saw you fall down probably didn't think badly of you they don't it, it's kind of like we do because we feel whatever we feel, I can, I can speak from direct experience. <laughs> My bat mitzvah, 13 years old, nervous as hell, went up to the bima and I tripped on the steps and it wasn't a little oopsie. It was like a big, like, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so I got up onto the bima and I don't even know how long it was. It, it seemed like forever. I just started laughing. Like I was purple. I just started laughing. I don't remember anything except for the fact that I finally pulled it together and then I continued and people didn't think, because I know this from people saying afterwards, first of all, the rabbis, when I went to shake hands afterwards, they were like, that was a really good icebreaker. <laughs> like, I'm like, it wasn't <laughs> bland, but people felt for me. People were like, you know, if anything, like, are you okay? It's right. It's, there was more of a feeling of empathy than you looked really stupid. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I don't really think um, <clears throat> people are a lot more compassionate than we realize. Yes. You know, we, we, we do tend to think that there's a lot of criticism, but there really is a lot of understanding <clears throat> and compassion that we're really not. But this idea you talked about of getting things out there, exploring things, I think that's so important uh, in terms of creativity. And in terms of, I mean, invention, yes. um, you know, the idea that, you know, that when you have an idea about something and you say, there's a problem you want to solve and you say, okay, what if we do this? But then as you're saying that, you you think of something else and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to work. What about this? And if you're doing that with a team of people and they're all doing it, you're probably going to come up with something pretty amazing. But it's when they stifle that, yes. you know, depending on the environment and that you that you're in. Uh, some environments do they just makes people nervous to have somebody have an idea and change their mind right in the middle, or <laughs> or or to have more than one idea, or to to have an open forum where lots of people are talking. Uh, there, you know, the federal government is kind of an example of that, where it's not. It's not open to that kind of thinking. And, um, you know, different bureaucracies have reasons for being the way they are. But I think that, you know, there's more innovation when you allow people to do that. Yes. Could not agree more. 
Could not agree more. Okay, so do you have any kind of a morning routine or evening routine? Um, let's see. Both. Oh, okay. I mean for creativity or just just in general. Through? Just in general. Um, every morning, pretty much at six o'clock, I go downstairs, make my coffee. And by the way, my dog sleeps with me. So he takes over the pillows when I go downstairs. <laughs> it's his ritual. <clears throat> and I get my cup of coffee and I it's usually I only have one cup a day and it's with soy vanilla creamer, which is to die for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I put a little bit of chicken in a dish, just a little. And I take that up for Harley because sometimes he has an upset stomach and they say that, you know, it's come, it's bile because their stomachs sometimes are too empty. So we now have this routine. So when I go back up, he's looking at me over the pillow. (laughs) (laughs) And, and and so then I take my coffee and give him his chicken and then he falls asleep again and then I uh you know get up and go about go about my day and it, sometimes he actually stays up there for a while that's what I find amusing and then Mosey's downstairs <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a very special routine for me um I look forward to that cup of coffee um it's just so good and uh and that quiet time I also look forward to the quiet time. Yeah. Yeah. So what is the, you said both uh, meaning a nighttime Uh, too. What is that? So in the evening, I go after everything is done, you know, and turn off the lights and I go upstairs and I put on my pajamas and I have a little den up there with a TV and uh, I have a recliner that has two seats in it, two reclining seats. So I, I have my pajamas on. I go in there and I, uh, uh, you know, they have that clicker thing that makes the feet go up on the yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. remote. It's a remote. So I go to the one side, which is Harley's side, and I open it up. <laughs> he comes, jumps, and lays it there. He, this is his thing. And then I sit in my side, and I use the remote, put the feet up, and turn the TV on, and then he comes over and sits next to me for a while. Uh, and then eventually he moses back to his side. <laughs> mm. <laughs> we watch the news, and uh, I love Erin Burnett, and so I watch her every night on CNN and uh, until about 9 o'clock. And then I go to – we go to bed, but I watch TV from my room in my uh, – room for a while longer you know any number of things usually fairly light things i don't like to watch a lot of heavy stuff late at night yeah yeah (laughs) i love it and anybody who has animals can kind of understand this i've always been a cat person we've always had cats and our cats are kind of like dogs they're very they love to be with us it's very important to them that they hang out with us they're near us they travel they go with us from room to room kind of thing but we have we've had a dog for the last six months that we've been watching for a friend and um she's really become part of the family and there is something with the dog that is different there is that kind of like literally and this dog is a lap dog and uh-huh. she literally is very much like did you just leave me alone? Yes. <laughs> what were you thinking by that <laughs> happening? <laughs> They're like a little person. They are. She I mean, literally is. Like a child, you know? Yeah. yeah. She has literally become part of the family. So um, in all of that and like a child and everybody understanding, this is why when the kids were young, I always said no to a dog because I was like, you know, who's going to end up having to take care of that. Yeah. And it's going to end up being me. But now that it's like the kids are old enough. Anyway, when she decides to wake up at four in the morning, my son will take her out. Um, and yeah, yeah. She just good. kind of wakes him up like, hey, hello, going outside, right? <laughs> <laughs> He's right. like, damn it. <laughs> but I love that. Thank you so much for sharing for sharing those. It's always great to hear what people do in order to wind up and the the, the little things, and I really appreciate you saying that 
especially in the morning, the quiet and that the taste, that tactile, that like you look forward to the taste yes. of what that, that creamer, like you specifically mentioned the creamer that's yummy. It's these ways that we treat ourselves, everybody. We give ourselves these, you could say, you know, you're giving yourself a treat. But it's like these things that you just enjoy, which makes it part of your day and you look forward to it. And when we do these things, it just it makes us happier human beings. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like you feel like you're treating yourself, you know. Um, I mean, I know like soy creamer, you would think, oh, that's got a lot of sugar. It really doesn't. It's not that bad. And given the amount of it, it's so small. Um, And we deserve it. And we deserve it. I mean, if I drank the whole quart, I would say you have a right. <laughs> it's one cup of coffee, and it's just so special every morning. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, so and I like that little routine with Harley too. You know, yeah. he's hilarious, but yeah, <laughs> his chicken. I, I every time I do that, and there are certain things that are just quirky for him. But uh, what comes into my mind is I have to write the book of Harley. Mm. You know, I have to write a book of Harley yeah. and just do his entire routine. Every little quirk that he has, you know, illustrate it somehow. I was thinking it would be great to illustrate it, you know, do just do a digital version so you could have, you know, video in there, you know, of him doing various and sundry things. Um, I mean, everybody who has a dog, they're going to have similar experiences, but um but it's nice to preserve who they are, you know. It is. It's relatable, and they're they're they have their personalities and their similarities and differences. And mm-hmm. animals are just incredible. They they truly truly are. So I can't believe we're almost at the top of the hour. It's insane how quickly the time goes. So the third and final question, which kind of wraps it up and puts a nice little bow on it, is why do you think? creativity is important um it's important uh, for the individual artist and it's important for society um for me it's important because it it gives me an opportunity to go deep within myself you know it's transformative it's cathartic um i it helps me learn about my own emotions my own thoughts things that You know, when you're inspired to do something, you don't know where that comes from. And sometimes I've written things that a year later I realize, oh, that was about that. You know, that was about that situation. I had no idea when I wrote it. Um, But for and so it's you know it's creative expression. It's a necessity. But for society, because it comes from a place of abandon, um, a place where there aren't any limits, that's as we talked about before, that's the basis of invention. Mm-hmm. And, and that's how we move forward and improve our lives. It's from creativity. Um, and we talked to about, um, you know, the fact when creativity is unencumbered, but it's what binds us together, you know, across cultures, um, across countries. Um, And I mean, just one of the one of the images I have in my mind from the lockdowns was when people started singing out of their balconies in Italy. And then suddenly everybody was singing, you know, that was that connection. So, you know, I think it's what's going to save us. That we have something that that binds us together, but also the, the, the most important part of it, too, is that it springs from each person sharing their own voice, Mm. you know, that it, it's important to empower people to share their own voice because they are unique. They are, they are something that has never existed before or ever will exist again. And so that's why it's so, so important, you know, like you are the only you that ever was or will be, you know, so your time is now. (laughs) You know, (laughs) this is what gets me every time, because when I ask people this, these are huge reasons. I'm like, 
<laughs> this is why creativity is important. What you said, everything that you said, it binds us together. There's no limits. It's like it improves our lives. It's creative expression. It's a necessity. It's the place for invention. I, I mean, what could be more important than that? Exactly. There is nothing more important than that. And this is when people see this, when people acknowledge it, when people acknowledge it within themselves. It's just expansive. There's 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 no limits. There's no it's just the possibilities are endless. And I just appreciate everything that you said. And very quickly, you just reminded me of what I was going to say before that I completely forgot was during COVID, one of the many threads, um, a, a teacher, a general ed teacher actually acknowledged special te specialist teachers, meaning art teachers, dance, music. And she wrote a letter publicly and shared it saying, I never appreciated you. I always thought that math and science and writing and everything was more important. But in actuality, you guys are the most important because what did we turn to during the pandemic? We turned yeah. to yoga. We turned to music. We turned to arts. We turned to cooking. Mm -hmm. um, we turned to all of these things that were expressive. That's how people found joy. Yeah. And she said, I'm sorry. Oh. So that's what maybe that's what I wanted to say before that just reinforced what you that's just said. That's wonderful. The joy is what helps us survive. Without joy, there's no life. There's no life. really not. So that's this, a wonderful story. That's a wonderful story. So this is just it's what because you mentioned this being taken out of the schools. And by taking these things out of the schools, everything that you just said is every reason why that cannot happen. Yeah. So, Vashti, how can people connect with you? Oh, um, well, let's see. Um, my my website has a, a contact form if you want to go that way. Um, I have um, uh, an email, uh, www. Uh, what am I saying? That's, that's my website. Um, email is... Um, vkpmovie at gmail.com okay so either your website or your email mm -hmm. great great so is there anything you feel like you want to say that you may have forgotten or it's top of mind before we say our goodbyes no i think we touched on everything <laughs> and then some yes. but thank you for having me hollis i really appreciate it nice. it's really fun I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for spending the time with me and just really inspiring us. Truly grateful. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I believe these conversations have always been important, but now I think that they are more important than ever. Please like, follow, share, spread the goodness because people really need to hear these messages in order to be able to see themselves in them in order to be able to hear these people's stories, in order to be able to expand their thinking. It is so important to really understand that creativity is life and everybody has creativity within them. To find out more about what we offer, go to IamCreativePhilly.com and you will see that there are services from publishing, multi-author and solo books, kits, workshops and retreats to creativity one-on-one -on -one coaching. So if you are ready to unleash your voice, break through your blocks and confidently share your story, I cannot wait to help you birth your ideas into the world.